Agile likes UX enough to invite me to talk because I've worked with Agile teams in these businesses um, and I've learned so much, not just about Agile, but also about my own discipline, user experience, um, and about how businesses consider the users, the place of users in the process, and who should care about users in general in the business. And I want to talk to you today about what I've learned and apply it really to these topics. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what is UX because I find that nobody really defines it always the same as somebody else. And there are lots of um, definitions of the discipline going around. Um, once you know what it is and therefore the type, the type of people and roles in it, I will explain to you how to get the right one for your job because no two UXers are the same. Then we'll look at, once you have them, how to maximize value. And once you have them, and they're the right one, and you're getting maximum value, how can you spread that benefit across the team? I'm going to try and weave a nice story, because user experience is all about storytelling. So, so very clever folks such as Michael Cummings have created this kind of diagram to try to explain what creates the experience that somebody has of a digital product. And it goes on this axis of conscious awareness. So the things that anyone is most consciously aware of is the written language, the aesthetics, such as the graphic design, the sound, or the motion, if any. The things that they're least consciously aware of, down at the bottom, way down, we have programming. It takes a programmer to know that, oh, this doesn't work, or it feels weird because it's not being coded right, or because there's a bug, or because there's something not answering. And in the middle, we have three things, interaction design, interface design, and information design. And that's the sweet spot. This is primarily where user experience is, okay? Generally, motion, sound, graphic design, written language, you have specialists. You have specialists in video and animation, specialists in sound. We don't do much sound in design anymore. The only sound we do nowadays is uh, putting sound to interactions on applications on mobile. Um, sound starts being reintroduced. We've gone completely away from the websites that started, you know, jumping in sound. Um, graphic design, realm of the graphic designer, and written language, realm of the copywriters who are just indispensable at finding the right words for the right thing. And from those three things, interaction, these um, that I said, um, information architecture, visual um, interaction design, um, and I can't remember the third one or whatever. What we really have are three disciplines that you may have heard of. Interaction design, information architecture, and user research. And very often there is a confusion that IXD equals IA equals UX. Uh, user research is kind of in it, but kind of not. Let's not even mention accessibility. Um, but what there really is, is there's a sweet spot at the crossover of these. And if you look at where these arrows go, interaction design ends up, if you keep pushing the interaction design, you will land into visual design. Mode, okay? So, which means there is a very fuzzy limit between interaction design and visual design at some point. The more interaction design goes and encompasses this, the more it, it is UX. Information architecture goes into two disciplines library science, which is a real science, <laughs> I know, and content management. Um, now, information architecture is all about organizing information. We don't use the word architecture lightly. We really think of an architect's blueprints. Nobody would build a house today without blueprints. Or if they do, they're generally not surprised with the result being a little bit wonky. It's all about organizing things. And the last one is user research, which ends with usability and accessibility testing. Okay, testing with users, researching users. Now, in this spectrum of disciplines and activities, there are two more things I'd like to mention uh, because they're, they come in and play. One of them is market research and business analysis, which you may not see because we've got this in the way. And market research and business analysis are, are traditional business disciplines. Um, business analysis has always been around for a while, just you know, figuring out what is the business, how does it work, what are its metrics. And market research has been here since the 50s when after the war and the uh, abundance of goods and more money and people to buy them, people started to figure out what about if we learn how people buy, how they consume, and then we can sell better. So marketing has started developing since the 50s and is now the uh, realm of a lot of data, of research that sort of works with user research. It still is about people, but it's not exactly measuring the same things. So when we have all these things, well, you start thinking, okay, so now I can see 
An information architect is not a user researcher. User researcher is concerned about people. They're interested in what they're doing, in how they use products, in what they want to achieve, in what device they have. They observe if the users of a product have an iPhone or a Windows phone, maybe no phone at all, maybe a Blackberry, but they don't use the Blackberry features, they only use the phone features. The interaction designer is interested in how the interaction, what the person has to manipulate information or to access information is. And quite rapidly, designing this interaction becomes the visual design because not only does it have to work, it also has to look good. <coughs> and information architecture organizes the content, but not just the items of content where images go here and copy goes there and sections go here. They organize the, the general magic of a site where the navigation tells you the story of the product of the company behind it and maybe of the purchasing process when you start seeing what it is um, how to buy it support and then about us this tells you the story that you should not be concerned about who the business is you should be concerned about what the product is and you should not have help before buying because god forbid you shouldn't help before you buy front and dev comes in at some point because all this doesn't exist if it doesn't become a reality. Um, but we have at the moment a long, arduous and difficult discussion in UX, which is should UXers code or not? Bleeding battleground. Just don't go there. <laughs> but front-end developers are actually a, a bit at the crossroad between here. We can start, we can almost start mapping. I could start and map this with every single business section. Um, but there is something about information architecture because the code needs to be organized. It, an object is an object that has to have defined properties. And it needs to come across visually in the way that's been intended. So once everything is here, well, what do we have? Well, we start having an idea of what people need to do. And when a junior UXer starts their career, they're expected to have all three disciplines under the hood. So they start small. If you take somebody who's just done, let's say, a two-month course at General Assembly, they would start really tiny. If they've done a master's at the universities in, in um, user experience design, they've got all three. But they should cover these three things. They've got solid base in information architecture. They know interaction design. They know user research. They may be better at one of these things. They may be naturally more interested in this because they're very visually orientated. Um, they're interested in tiny details. They don't mind pushing pixels around. So they've got a strong pull towards interaction design. Or they could be you know, really determined to organize content and make it its sense and structure and be naturally very formative and more towards information architecture. Or they can be very much interested in people, understanding them, what their problems are, what um, needs do they have, the products need to meet, and therefore they need, they're more naturally inclined towards user research. As a junior, they should have all these three covered. So any junior you hire will have some basic skills in all three and nothing else. They may have additional skills because they were a visual designer before, or because they were a content management expert, or maybe they were into marketing. We're seeing in, in UX a lot of people retrain after an initial career. Uh, the majority of people have had other lives before, mostly because it's a discipline that did not have much training for itself until about three, four years ago. You had some degrees in human-computer interaction, but they were lengthy, they're at master's level, they take you know, quite a bit of determination, they were not well known. UX is now completely exploding, we're seeing a lot more short-term courses, we're seeing a lot more inclusion of HCI into other disciplines, so you're now seeing people coming from other skills. But basic junior UXer has all this. So when they're in midweight, well, they start growing again equally in all three. They've seen more products, they've uh, started working. Junior stays about two years, one to two years as a junior. I like to keep them green for a long time. Um, let them make mistakes under supervision of a senior. As a midweight, they start seeing more complex problems. They start having more autonomy. They start being um, given more responsibility in designing solutions with a greater team. And they generally, st they still work under the supervision of a senior. And finally, when you have a senior, you start having little bubbles of extra knowledge. So still expanding knowledge, but this is where at senior level, we'd expect somebody to specialize or to really develop an ability. It can be an interaction design, it can be an information architecture, it can be in user research. Those little nipples of knowledge, um, as I've seen them called. It's all about, <laughs> I know, well, yeah, it's gonna be in your mind now, I can tell you. <laughs> and it's, this is how science works. 
okay? This is how you can start getting into uh, PhD and knowledge. Like you, you grow your general knowledge, but then you really expand in the disciplines that are the easiest to you and are the most interesting to you. And I always say to the UXers that, that I train, at the moment I give a course at General Assembly, which is a really entry level, you know, what is UX? It's one day, and basically they understand what's happening behind those disciplines. They are not made UXers in a day. Uh, but I'm all about telling them, find out, if you're interested in UX, find out what exactly you're interested in. Are you a highly visual, interactive person? You delight in observing how the screens react, um, in wondering if a drop-down would be better than another type of list, um, in wondering if changing the speed of a drop-down would not create another emotion that would be more appropriate to the product you're designing. Um, if they're extremely organized and meticulous, and I say, well, look, Thankfully, we've got this big field of information architecture, which is essential to an experience. You can have the most beautiful, polished interaction. If the content does not match the user's mental models, if they, it doesn't make sense, there's no point. The experience is completely broken. And similarly, user research, if you have to... UX is all about working with the users, so you have to have those user research skills. But you have to be interested and able to listen to them, carefully to hear what they say and to bring that knowledge back to the business. It's not everyone's forte. A great facilitator in user research is somebody who makes anybody at ease, who's able to hear the most atrocious things or the ones <coughs> they're the most uncomfortable with and still remain neutral, open, generating conversation and then has the ability to analyze what they've said and bring it back to the business. Somebody who's really, really good here is very likely not really, really good there as well. You will have some exceptions that some people are absolutely brilliant at visual design and experimenting with interaction models and understanding the mechanisms of the various platforms that we have to design for. And they're also extremely gifted at making anybody talk so that they understand the problems of this person and their needs when using the product. That's the exception. The rule is, if you're a highly social person, if you're somebody that makes others comfortable, that make them talk, you're unlikely to be equally comfortable for hours on end in front of your computer experimenting with tiny details. Similarly, when you're all about organizing the world and creating structures that make sense, not just to you, but to everyone else as well, you can see how it doesn't necessarily work very well with everything, okay? So what I'm saying is, you start having those bubbles of knowledge because not everyone is every good is good at everything. Which begets the next question: How do I get the right one? And a lot of, of the questions that I get is, okay, so I've got this product, I've got this team, and I need UX magic powder sprinkle on the product, I'll make it better. Um, now you've really confused me uh, because you know what? I, I I really like the agile part where we test things, so I want somebody who's good at this. But you know what, we, we really need to make our designs work well and to, to get that. We want that amazing experience that some people have with some products. And at the same time, we have some content. And I can see the logic of having being able to tell a story with the content, but you're just telling me that they can't be good at everything. Let's see. Small detour. Does, is anybody not familiar with this? Raise your hands courageously, OK? <laughs> I know, it's a tough question. So I remember the big story of Agile. Hey, we've got a product backlog. Then we start having a sprint backlog. We have some user stories. We get some sprints. We get some demos, deliverable, job done. Woohoo, we're in business. So where does UX fit in there? Well, not easily. Because what I want to tell you about is the story that happens before. Because half of the story happens before we get Agile, before it enters the dev room. And one of the massive pitfalls is if anything enters the dev room and has not been put this through this spinner before, okay? If the idea or the concept or what's in the backlog is at glint in the CEO's eye stage, it's going to go horribly wrong in there. Guaranteed. That's, that's the recipe for disaster, it will go in the backlog, it will go in the sprints, there'll be some stories, there'll be some build, there'll be some delivery, and then it doesn't make any sense. Because the really important part, and it's all about being in business, the business needs to know what it wants. Are you building bathrooms or are you animating cruises? 
Some businesses do not make choice. They're like, we do everything. And then they are surprised they don't do business. So business needs to figure out, we are here to deliver the best shopping experience for shoes. Tony Sue, Zappos, okay? Then you need to have a user exploration. Business says, yeah, I want to make a lot of money from selling shoes well. Does anybody want to buy shoes, by the way? Do they want to buy shoes online? Or do they have credit cards to buy online? Can we ship to them? You need to explore your users or customers. I use user and customer indifferently, but to the business is a big difference because your customer is not selling your customer. Once you've explored what the business wants and what the user wants, and maybe it's in the other way or maybe they're simultaneous, okay? It depends. Then you have to start designing what's going to happen. When I say design, I don't mean visual graphic design. I don't mean pretty pictures. I don't mean screens or prototypes. I mean design in transforming knowledge to give it a new meaning, which is we take our business exploration, we take our user exploration, we mash them, bubble, 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 and as it falls down, we realize, well, hang on a second. Yeah, we want to sell shoes. Good news, people still want shoes. Yes, they have credit card, but we cannot deliver to PO boxes. And you start figuring out what you want. You start designing the experience. How do we handle people with PO boxes? Can, do we not sell them shoes? Is that the sweet spot, selling to these people? Once you've figured this out, then you can develop. And so often I'm seeing this stage either not done well or just a business has explored and said, yeah, we want to sell boats to Russia. Russia wants boat, good news. Is it a good idea to sell boats to Russia? The jury is out. I'm French, by the way, so it's high on my agenda at the moment. Um, but this is the part we need to start involving you with because this is what happens, okay? Sorry, too fast. So you remember our little bubble towards user research? Well, you need that skill at that stage, okay? Our little bubble of information architecture and or interaction design, well, you need it at that stage because by now you know where your user, maybe it's another person or whatever, let's see. Um, and here, you need a magical unicorn who does everything and fixes everything that has not been fixed until then. So of course, that's where the biggest problem is. The biggest problem is that you need different skills at different stages, and you also need to involve UX as early as possible. Preferably, like just a few millimeters into business exploration. The, the, biggest, the biggest bad news UX can tell you is you're gonna have to rebuild from scratch because you've involved me here, and I can sort of run and catch up and, and, and figure out your users and figure out the experience. But if you're eons ahead of me, inevitably, I will tell you, you need to rebuild what you've done and you need to change what you want to do. So waiting a long time to hear very bad news, not a great business proposal. So how to get the right UX suit? Know what you want, know what you need, get them at the right stage. And by now you should understand a little bit better what the different specialties do. And when you see the CV of a UXer, if they do a little bit of everything, great, they're multitaskers, but do ask them, where are you most at ease? What do you prefer doing? What is it, we've got three tasks to do, I need to hire three UXers, one for user research, one for information architecture, which one do you want? Um, they need to know themselves well to be good at their job. And then you can make a choice to expand in those disciplines or not. For my part, INA is not my strongest suit. I've got my, I've got my senior skills. I cannot do, as in physically I would jump off the building, the extensive audit of, let's say, a massive site that has no idea what has gone on its pages, has been up for 10 years, and needs to rehaul the whole thing. Uh, but, you know, just walk up in the attic and just see what's going on in there, and please organize it on your way down. Like, I, I don't do IA jobs. I know it, I don't take the jobs, I'm being responsible. There is a lot at the moment, there's so many, there's so much demand for UX, and there's so few experienced, qualified people in the market that you get a lot of wannabe UXers who have a genuine interest in users, have read a couple of books, have attended a conference or two, stem themselves senior UXer and hop into the job, and it's a car crash. So look at their experience, check out where they've learned from, how they understand the different disciplines, what is their mindset, okay? Are they most at ease um, fin finessing the experience and the interaction? And a typical deliverable would be wireframes, highly detailed, or maybe prototypes. 
but it's all about the details and every single use case, okay? Are they systematically trying to make sense of everything? And you ask questions, but you know, what does it relate to? You can, in the vocabulary, you will hear this kind of, I need to put the world in order uh, question. And our user researchers will always be like, I want to talk to users. When are we seeing users? Where can I find users? Can I go out with the salespeople? Can I go to a convention and meet your customers? Um, and they're not being annoying. They're doing their job. Any questions so far on our three areas of UX and how they fit in the process? Anything you've never heard? Like, oh my god, that's brand new. Where did that come from? I should rehash stuff you've heard, but maybe not always put together in the same way. Yeah. Do you, um, these three type of UX designers, do they like get on? Is it quite easy for them to get on? It's because, quite, yes. Because I, we've got a visual designer who's like very set in like the way that he wants to do stuff with the brand. And, yes. and then we have a service designer who's, you know, just trying to get a, some service that we can deliver to the, the, um, the user. To the user. And those two are yes. really... They're at yeah. one another? Yeah. It works if the business knows it goes. If there is a business vision you can hang on to, which <coughs> is our vision is to be the best ones at selling shoes to anyone on the planet. If the business vision is weak, you cannot create a strong brand because the brand, even visually, needs to hang on to principles. And you cannot create the service because at every moment, it'll be one day we're shipping to everybody. Or actually, we're only shipping to people in, I don't know, the, the, the second half of the country or you know, the, second tier, the second tier cities in China. Um, or we are only catering to people with American Express. Like, if the vision is not clear, you cannot design for it. So I would push the problem higher up, generally. Clarity of the brief, very often. Just mentioning service designers, um, my background is a bit service designer, but yeah. UX, but I'm quite interested in your definition. Where does, compared to, I, th I find that the skills for a service designer and UX are often quite interesting, but what yeah. is your definition of service design as opposed to UX? So service design expands beyond digital. UX mm -hmm. now is very much restricted to digital, yeah. whether it's mobile, kiosks, yeah. um, platform and platforms and museums. Mm -hmm. um, service design covers the experience at every touch point with the brand, in locations, through other media, in the press, on radio, um, at conferences. And for me, service design can also cover product design if your experience has a product and an online experience. Um, so I was, what was, what did I see? This product where women take their temperature and it gets logged in so they can find out if they're fertile or not. Um, and it has a physical product, it has a temperature, um, a thermometer that is specially linked to also take other measures, and the online experience. So you start seeing that the product design needs to match with the online design. So maybe a service designer can help bridge that, mm -hmm. or you take a product designer with a strong sense of online, where to find, because mm -hmm. they're, they're taught physical material skills. They're taught how to draw, they're taught to understand the physical properties of plastics, of metal, of wood, production, um, needs, whereas UX were all about um, what happens on screens mostly. Rarely do we spend outside screen. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Is it, do you think there's ever, there obviously is a relationship between these three types of people and a sort of psychological type? I mean, in terms of, you know, it's my Briggs type thing, I'm thinking of. So, you know, you're, you're where I'm going with this, and what I'm trying to say is people are naturally more inclined in certain activities and my recommendation to anybody considering a new career is to go where you are naturally gifted for 80% of your time i.e. 9 to 5 Monday to Friday and keep 20% of your time your weekends and evenings to something really challenging that's taking you out of your comfort zone um, so that if you fuck up you still make a good living and this is why I'm saying nobody can be any good and I don't I, Mostly because I don't want to become an ace information architect. I, I actually am not interested in expanding my skills in this area. Um, maybe I should, maybe I would get better jobs, better pay, working for prestigious brands. Um, but actually I kind of think that we have a place for generalists and yours, your senior is a generalist, they can do a lot. But if your product has specific needs, so for an IA you would need a product that's very content rich, 
So I've seen needs for IA with mobile phones. So when I was at Orange, they had content man a content manager who was amazing because there's just so much content, which is not just the device and the photographs, but how all the information was related to the help and to the My Account section that it needed some serious sense. Um, an interaction designer, unless you're really on the path to completely revolutionize um, the experience of, I don't know, booking a cab with creating completely different interactions with a map where I can tap the cab that I want, I don't know. But do you really, really need, oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's Google, yeah, whatever. Um, so that's it. Like, I, would, I would challenge the fact that you need to be good at everything. And equally, um, I would say, don't be, I don't care, it's everybody's password, you can look at it. Um, don't hire too junior. Like, make sure that the person you're getting on board has the right skills, which means you need to know how complex your product is. Bit of a chicken or egg situation. Or home. Here we go. So now, now that you know you've got the crowds running at you for your amazing company, your fantastic product, your unique opportunities, and you manage to pick one out of the masses because you know what your product wants to do, whether you are um, a product owner or a business owner, whoever has been in charge of bringing the first UX or in the business, hopefully is in the room today and knows how to hire them. So how to maximize value from them? Well. I like this image because it comes from the Paralympics. And in this photo, the woman in the center, Ms. Clegg, is blind. And she's running for the 100 meters in the Paralympics. And she can run, although she is 100% blind, because she's got a helper. They've got this little link between the two of them. And all he's there to do is to keep her running in her track so she doesn't go veer out. And all she has to do is run as fast as she can. He's running just as fast, by the way. So it really is challenging. You maximize value by this, creating this in your business. And it's, I'm not saying it's easy. But by understanding what the runner does very, very well, which is running very fast, let her get, letting her get on with it, and providing just enough that she can get on with it, this is how you maximize somebody's value. So by now, hopefully, you understand better what a UX user does in terms, I haven't gone into the specifics of deliverable, but you start understanding at least a little bit UX, IXD, IA, user of research. You know which ones you want because you know what need your product has. You know what gaps you have in your understanding of your users, of the organization of your content, or how the experience is on the screen. You know if you're a product, your needs are going to be different if you're a product very early on in its lifestyle, life cycle just being an idea that you want to experiment or if it's a running product where you have legacy. And you're not going to need to be hugely innovative with a legacy product. Generally, you need to tidy up a heck of a lot of crap. So you maximize value by enabling and accompanying and running alongside. Okay, in lots of ways, he's all, he, should, he doesn't set the pace. She sets the pace. He just runs along. So that means that the teams that work with UX need to align, they need to experiment, they need to train together to find the pace that's right so that everybody can get on with their job. So that the UXer does not become a pixel pusher, um, an additional resource for visual design, or they don't become locked away with users and then they just throw reports over the wall. It doesn't work that way. It is never a relay day. So I know I put out earlier on in those slides the business um, understanding, understanding users, figuring out the design, and then you enter the agile process. But it should never be a relay game. Okay, we've done the research up front, oh, off you go, you develop, have a good race, we'll be watching from the sides, recuperating our breath. Um, if you pass on, there's a massive risk that the baton falls, <coughs> which happens a lot. Um, there's a massive risk that you don't give information that, hey, this guy is really dangerous and really felt like watch out for him, or that, hey, the ground is just incredibly slippery, watch out. Relay races only work in the Olympics for very fast runners. Because where it really, really works, and I did this drawing for um, um, a product owner that I was, I was coaching, and if you can read, we've got the business stakeholders here, and we've got <coughs> our PO there. Now, the PO's role is to take in what the business stakeholders want and to bring it to the team. They don't replace, they channel. So that you may have 
one, two, two hundred, twenty million stakeholders, it doesn't matter, you have one PO bringing it to the team. Our users are brought in by the UXer and design as well. And our tech team is here. And our tech team answers to future developers. Every developer is accountable for the developer who come after them, so we don't constantly hear, oh, we need to refactor this, it was just horribly written. Uh, anything you do is accountable to the person who will pick up the code after you, and therefore to the greater tech community. So whether your um, software you're using, um, open source or not, you're accountable because there's a legacy to what you do. UX is accountable to the user. Okay, when they see somebody, when I see somebody struggling on the street with somebody I, I help build, I genuinely feel bad. And I know there are lots of reasons it doesn't work, anyway. And design is also accountable, similarly, to use, but also to a greater design community where we are answerable for what we've done. We're recruited on our portfolios. There are some projects that I worked in that are not in my portfolios because they were painful from start to finish. The end result is atrocious. And all I did was trying to make people work nice together which says a lot about my capacity to work as a group and a lot of what Agile is. In Agile, there's a lot of talk about cross-functional teams and making sure that the skills are across the team. Is there a specialization or no specialization? Again, huge about that, bring your axe. Um, I absolutely believe that there is one team, that it is well known, the team is limited and its perimeter is determined by the people who show up and work on it at the known intervals as part of the rituals, okay? You cannot come in one day in a retrospective or in a scrum and decide you're part of the team because you're a stakeholder. You're a stakeholder, you answer to the PO. Um, therefore, if it's one team and they work together all the time, it starts a lot easier to pass on some skills um, <coughs> simply by putting everyone in the rituals or as much as possible, including the UX or even when they're dropped across several projects, like they should endeavor to attend as many of the rituals of each team as possible and make sure that there are no clashes. Scrub of stand-ups, generally clashes, that's okay. They're all at 9.05 or 9.35, sometimes at 10.05 in some teams. The 05 lets the latecomer just come in and join. Um, and be available through any means as possible. Um, and therefore, you start enabling this link by being present at the touch points with the team, but also sitting or coming across the team, even if it's remotely. Uh, this is something Darcy talked a lot about this morning, so I'm not going to cover it, but you build trust progressively in the UX. It comes with time, it comes with interaction, and it comes with respect for everybody's skills on the team. Because there is a lot of things that UX wants to be part of. So again, remember, we've got our disciplines. I did not break that one down. That was from um, something called UX is not UI.com. UX wants to be seen as doing field research, face-to-face -face interviews, creation of user tests, gathering and organizing statistics, creating personas, product design, feature writing, requirement writing, graphic arts, interaction design, information architecture, usability, prototyping, interface design, interface design, visual design, taxonomy creation, technology creation, copywriting, presenting and speaking, working tightly with programmers, brainstorm coordination, design culture, evangelism. <laughs> what? Oh, UX, yeah, you did, you did a design thing with the colors? <clears throat> okay? So, make sure you use those skills. Um, and then how the UX are spread across. Because the really, the really the best way to create a cross-functional team is first of all, to say that concern for the users is not the sacred ground of the UX specialist. Who comes in prancing on his white unicorn, sword at the ready, to defend the user against the evil of bad business owners and evil developers. Everybody in the team, everybody in the business should be concerning users. And I am sometimes astonished by the gap that has happened in businesses where consumers and customers are seen as a commodity and the real allegiance is to the boss or the boss's boss. And yeah, customers, yeah, we'll just sell to them with amazing sales, but I need to make Nick happy. I don't care about our 10 million customers. If the business does not respect customers, as a UXer, I don't walk through the door. Like, I've got better things to do with my life, thank you very much. Uh, but then don't be surprised if it doesn't trend, come down in the product. So concern for users is spread equal, equally across the team. And you do that, for example, by having developers watch user research and bringing them out. Uh, there are some 
teams that have as a rule that every six weeks, everybody on the team watches two hours of users interacting with the product. Two hours every six weeks, like that is not a stupid amount of time taken away, oh my god, we're gonna slow down, we won't deliver on time, I'm a developer, I'm not a user, you know, all the, skip the drama, like it's two hours every six weeks, which really helps create an understanding of users. Once everybody understands users, it becomes a lot easier to go from the functional, it works, to efficacious, it works particularly well, to it's just great. UXers aim for this. We want great. We want to create great experiences where nobody says, oh, that drop down is stupid. Because no, the user should never notice the drop down. Just like when you see a person well dressed, you should not notice if it's because their tie is coordinated to the stripes of their suit or because the lipstick matches the shoe. It's like, wow, this, this, you look great. And this is where we aim. We can only go there if we've all moved away from functional, takes the box delivered, into efficacious, it works and it works well, to the next stage, it creates a great experience. And one way of getting there, and I could spend weeks talking about it, is to really lower the fidelity of UX deliverables, okay? Developers are not in the business of delivering lines of code. Nobody's work should be measured in lines of codes delivered. UXers should not be measured in numbers of wireframes. Delivering 200 wireframes has not made Facebook what it is, okay? And when I say lowering, I say lowering. If I throw this up over the wall, it will not work. But hey, I'm working with my team. We're all concerned about the users. We've been working together. I'm involved in the rituals. You understand what I do. You understand if I'm an IA or a user researcher or a hybrid. We're all clear on what we're trying to achieve. And we're constantly talking. So that starts making a lot of sense to you. Maybe because we even designed it together. We sat down together on a post-it note and I scribbled. And you, as a developer, you know exactly how it is, what it is. You know exactly what it does, why we're doing it, and you probably even have an idea of how to do, how to solutionize it. So when this comes up in our planning, that measly little post-it with a sketch, you're like, yeah, that's a two-hour job, and I know exactly how to do it. I've thrown a lot of questions at you, a lot of stuff. So do you have any questions so far on what we've done? Yes. Um, Talked about there were three steps before you get to the to the scrum model. Yeah. And um, get the slide. just on that last slide, you also talked about not just throwing things over the wall and being working yeah. in with the team as well. But those two things seem a little bit different. But, yes. Sense. The reality is, UX comes in, and it's already ongoing. Either because the product is already rolling, or because the business had got the development going first. Because oh, we. It's going to be digital, so they might as well start coding because we will need a login. So I don't need a UXer to tell me how to log in. Actually, maybe you do need a UXer, but because maybe what you need is not just a login, but you need single sign-on because you've got another product that this target group is not exactly the same, but it could be in the near future. So instead of just doing a login and then fighting to do single sign-on later on, why don't we do it right now? So timing is of the essence. If the UXer is dropped in at this stage, I mean, of course I'm not going to tell everybody just avoid these jobs and leave, leave teams in the lurch. Um, but if possible, bring them in early so that they can set up the scene well and help things go well. <coughs> if not, give them time to work at the stage. So you keep them through the process? I mean, Absolutely. All the way? Absolutely, yes. Um, and it changes the, the rhythm and it changes what is outputted because every team is different. There is no magic recipe for getting UX and Dev to work at the same pace. Some team, after a while, find their rhythm, and maybe it's two weeks ahead, or one week ahead, or two months ahead. But every product, every <coughs> team, every audience, every business environment is different. There's no magical recipe. Time really helps sort out a lot of you know, the kings and the machines. One last question, two, two more minutes. Two more questions. Yes. Um, so we have a bit of a problem internally where um, we will have a designer and they may be an, um, a UX designer or they may be more of a visual designer, but they'll do some sort of work, some sort of deliverable, it'll be run past the client, we'll talk about it, that'll be awesome. 
um, and, and the client will kind of go, yeah, that, that's cool, that's great. And then we go to a sprint plan meeting and we try and write stories about it. And actually, we've already defined how that thing should work by the wireframes or visual mm. design, whatever. And but we haven't gotten input from the developers at that point. And actually, the developers are like, well, um, it doesn't you know, work. It, it doesn't. It doesn't work the way you want it to. Or we could do it like that, but it might be three times as long. Um, and I've had uh, real difficulty trying to make. Uh, we've tried design sprints, we've tried various different other approaches to development to kind of merge that into the visual and the UX, um, and none of it is really entirely working really the way I want. Question one, are they sitting in proximity? Um, yeah, so we so the, the visual designer is also a front-end developer, so um, uh, more, um, and all of them will be in the future as well. Um, but it's Why? sort of... Um, because it's it's it an internal time. no well no it's an internal principle for us uh, to to not go too far off the the, the technical um, and we have user researchers and service designers um, around that okay so you've got a lot of ingredients a lot of chefs in the kitchen yeah and it's not working um, very well I think it's it more, has it, so if if I was doing it um, if I was able to entirely set the pace and not deal with the clients, which is impossible because we're an agency, um, then I would probably do something like um, build a first iteration based on the functionality that the users actually want in Bootstrap or something similar, and then actually go back and think about how the visual design works later. So that's going to work twice. Okay, so this this begins a big question, which is every circumstances, every team or, or, or have a, um, have their own issues. Agencies and agile, I've never seen it. Ever. Okay. For the simple reason that the client is out of the process, clients walked in, said, here's the brief, yeah. 300,000, two months, get job done, I've got things to do, cigars to smoke. Comes back in after two weeks, oh good, it's there. Oh, this is shit. <laughs> Slams the door, sure. screams, shouts, it's costing me so much, buggers off away, and then you're left all alone. The secret to agile is communication. So and, and that's also the secret of great build. Like yeah. every product that was built well is because at every opportunity the business came in, assessed the product without having to constantly deliver and re-deliver. Having a, a bootstrap prototype is doing the job twice. So we can continue this after because yeah, I mean it's, it's a bigger product. But I will say, the more you segregate and separate these steps, the more you isolate the discipline, sure. the less it will work. Sure. And which means people need to work nice together, which is not easy. Thank you very much.